Well, it's been an interesting morning for you and for me. It might even be more interesting in the moments to come. I didn't want to say I didn't really want to preach today on All Saints Day because um, the Vikings uh, played the Saints. <laughs> and uh, so I didn't really know what I wanted to say about the Saints today. Not real fond of them. But uh, anyway, um, I'm here today because uh, Leon and I took a staycation. You can see how that works. And uh, we thought uh, we wanted to, well, we want to worship here. We always love worshiping here uh, whenever we're not here. We love coming here. It's hard to go anywhere else, to be honest with you. And I think some of you experience that. It's, it's not just the music, but it's, it's the people. It's you. And every morning I wake up, Sunday morning, I go, wow. Um, I, I get to be with, with people that, that show me love, and I get to show love back. Don't you feel that way? I, I hope you do. I, I, I really do. And of course, getting to a baptism is, uh, is always just the, the frosting on the cake, so to speak. Well, today is All, all Saints Day. And um, I'm not going to try to duplicate, emulate what Pastor Mann did at the first service. It was a beautiful sermon on what it means to be a saint, a sinner saint in this life. I'm going to take a little bit different tack on it because when I look at All Saints Day, I think of all saints. And I also think of a connection, a historical connection we need to make to All Saints Day that a lot of us forget about or maybe never even knew. Believe it or not, All Saints Day is directly connected to the very um, famous or infamous uh, holiday celebration, I think, that takes precedence even over Christmas in some places in Texas here, and that's Halloween. Let me just ask, how many of you celebrated in some form or fashion Halloween? See what I mean? All right. Now, um, but Halloween, it, it's, it, it's really interesting. Uh, there's lots of different beliefs about Halloween, uh, but we've got to start there. Um, it's, it's origins. People wonder, well, is it pagan? Is it a Christian beginning and its validity are not for Christians even to celebrate. I remember growing up, you know, where my parents were fine with it, you know, strong believers in Jesus Christ. I think that's why they were fine with it, you know, whereas some people are like, oh no, as a Christian, you're not going to celebrate Halloween. But um, there is certainly evil on, 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 on that evening. You, you see it in different places across the country. Anoka, Minnesota, I know still has a witch's coven there that always lights up, literally, houses in Detroit and so forth on uh, on, on Halloween night. So there's a lot of evil. But for those of you who are concerned about celebrating Halloween, you believe in Jesus Christ, you're okay. You're, you're, you're safe. You're, you're safe. Now, historically, the roots of Halloween are not from Satanism, regardless of what some people may say. They're actually from, from Scotland, the land of the Celts. And, and the Celts, they had an order of priests called the Druids. How many of you ever heard of Druids before? Yeah, the, the Druids priests. And they believed that when their loved ones died, that they would enter this land of, of youth and eternal happiness. And, uh, but one day each year when the season would change, this time of year, from the summer to the fall, um, when, the, when the grass and the leaves would, would grow brown and fall off the trees and things like that, they believed that there was a veil between the living and the dead that was at its thinnest. And that's when the spirits of departed loved ones would walk the streets would walk the street. I got, I got to tell this to you because this is kind of interesting. We had a group of, of, of people from our church over to our house for Halloween who had children, and they had to taste uh, my pumpkin seeds that I made. And uh, it, was, uh, it, was a, it was a good time raining and all that, but, um, but uh, Narina, is Narina here? Did she make it here? Oh, you're in the back. Hi, Narina. And um, so Narina's from Armenia, and so I asked her if they celebrate Halloween in Armenia. She said, well, no, but they, just, they actually just started like uh, three years ago. And I said, really? I said, how do they celebrate it? And she says, well, they, they, they put makeup on, and then they go walking on the streets. And I said, did they go to a big party then and after that? She said, no. I said, do they go house to house and collect candy? She says, no, I don't think they know what to do yet. <laughs> I thought that was just so innocent and so pure. It's like, you know what, it, it, to, to her and to them, it's, just, it's, a, it's a tradition. They're Christians and they're celebrating it. But there is a Christian connection, and I'm going to get to that. Um, so what, what they used to do was, was they would believe that the spirits of their loved ones would rise from the dead. They believed in the mystery of the rising from the dead. Oh, another Christian connection, right? And they would walk among the living, and because they'd been dead for so long, they were hungry. And so they would go from house to house, and they would beg for food. And if you didn't give them anything, um, they would be mad. And so they would play practical jokes on you. They would play tricks on you if you didn't give them a 
Treat, right, okay. Some of you got that. All right, and then they would do those tricks to the owner of the house. Well, um, to avoid a prank and to show honor to your loved ones who had gone before you uh, and respect for them, you would take out their human skulls. <laughs> yeah, they would actually keep them. Um, and they would place them out, outside their doors as a way of saying, hey, Uncle Bob, you know, <laughs> we're here for you. We still remember you. And, um, and then if Uncle Bob would pass by that night, he'd know you still cared. Well, when Christianity came on the scene, they really frowned on that practice. I can't imagine why. Um, and, 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 and so, so the, the placing of human skulls outside the homes then, then uh, because they discouraged that, they turned it into the carving up of large turnips, all right? Um, and then they would place that out there. Um, they have a lot of turnips in, in Scotland. And then when the Scottish custom was, was, was brought to America, instead of uh, skulls or turnips, they used pumpkins, and thus we have the jack-o'-lantern. Aren't you glad you came today? Told you I was going to wing it, try to talk about different things. But this, is, but this is important. This is an important connection. Now, over the years, this holiday, it, 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 it moved further and further away from honoring and respecting the dead to a night of evil and mischief. That's because we're sinful human beings, and that's, that's how it all works. So the Christian church chose to rename Hallow that evening of the mischief, of evil and the mischief, all that, to Halloween, which means holy evening. So if you celebrated on Halloween evening, it was actually a holy evening, as dubbed by the Christian church, all right? And um, All Hallows' Eve, that's what that means, and that's where Halloween comes from. It's an evening to honor, to honor departed loved ones who believed in Jesus Christ when they died. That's what it's about. So, that's really one crowd of people I want to talk about today because I know we had a crowd of people, a crowd of kids and adults dressed in costumes and, 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 and some in fun and, and some in mischief and some in ignorance, not really knowing what it's all about, but just having a good time. But the other crowd I want to talk about today, which is the most important crowd, is what I call the heavenly crowd. And I hope that in, in talking about this that it can help each of us kind of get a better glimpse of the crowd that is in the heavenly realm and that is looking down upon us and saying come on you can do it you got to get here because what i'm experiencing is real this is a crowd of 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 christians and people who've been celebrating uh, christians who've been celebrating this since the ninth century all right um and that's where the All Saints Day came from. So you have the Holy Eve, and then on this day came in, and the Christian church put the two together. It's a celebration of that crowd of people who've already gone to be with the Lord, all right? That's what it's all about. Now, it's that crowd of people that represented, that is represented by the candles here today, the candles you're going to light on your way out. That's why I asked you early on to think about someone you know and, and love. I know always on this day I think about my mom and dad. I, I love them very much. I miss them. Uh, a lot, and um, so we'll be, we'll be talking about that kind of stuff in a little bit. In Hebrews chapter 12, though, the author paints a picture of that crowd. I want to read that to you right now. He, he, he paints it almost like an amphitheater, and this is a text that Pastor Mann used out of, out of the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, All right, so he's painting this picture, amphitheater, saying a great cloud of witnesses, so it's not crowd, but cloud of witnesses, meaning they're in the heavenly realms, all right? And then he goes on to say, because they are there and they are witnesses to us, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run the race of life with perseverance, the race that's marked out for us. How? By fixing our eyes on Jesus by never losing sight that we have a Savior in Jesus Christ. I love that picture, and it's the picture that, that I see when I think of my father especially. I think about him up there in the heavenly realm going, go, Marty, go, you can do it, no matter how tough it gets. I want you to just take a moment and think about that. Think about someone you know and love who knew Jesus Christ. They were not perfect beings. They were sinners. But they were believers in Jesus, and they're in that cloud of witnesses right now, cheering you on. 
That's the picture that God gives us through the Apostle Paul. This heavenly crowd is a crowd of people that God describes for us, especially in the last book of the Bible, Revelation. And we just talked about this, I think it was just last week when we talked about this, but I'm going to talk about this again. There's different, just like with Halloween, how there's different interpretations about it, there's different interpretations about what I'm going to read, but I want you to hear at least my interpretation today from Revelation, the seventh chapter. If you've got a Bible with you, open it up. If you've got your phone with you, open it up to that. Revelation 7, we're going to look at verses 2 through 4 to begin with. And here's how it reads. When I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God, he called out in a loud voice to the four angels, who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. By the way, that's just what happened to Brooks. He got a seal. The mark of Jesus Christ. That's what that is. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Think about that. That's why every time a child comes up here, that's why I always make the sign of the cross on them and remind them of their baptism. And I hope that reminds you of yours as well. He goes on to say, Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. And as I said last week, it goes on to say 12,000 from this tribe and 12,000 from this tribe. It goes on to say... Now, a couple things about this, this crowd. First of all, numbers in Revelation aren't always what they appear to be. They are symbolic in nature. But I believe that what this is saying, by saying 144,000, it's a number of completion. 12 is the number of church times 1,000, a number of perfect completion. We got 144,000. It's not 144,000 literally. It is all believers in Jesus Christ, believers in the promise to come and believers in the promise fulfilled on the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the crowd. That's the number. It's a huge number. It's a number so huge that it cannot be counted. He goes on to say, I want to move to verse 9 then in chapter 7. After this, I looked. He heard the number. Then he looked, and there's what he saw. Before me was a great multitude no one could count. From every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. All ethnic groups. All ethnicities, all their offspring, people of every language, from every background, every culture, every country, every clan, every dialect, every region, every social class, everybody. That's the crowd. Every group on earth is represented in this number. It's a huge crowd, and it's throwing a party. That's what they're doing. Listen, in, in the last part of verse 9, they were standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. They were wearing robes of leisure, okay? That's what that means there. It's, 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 it's robes of relaxation and, and peace. And, this, and the white of the robes is a symbol of purity, of righteousness, getting right before God. They were made white and right before God. And it goes on to say, that they were holding palm branches. And if you go back to the, to the day when, when uh, Jesus rode into Jerusalem and they waved palm branches, this talking to Pastor Munch, thank you for being here today, and he said, something just hit me. You know those palm branches, that's really a sign, a Maccabean sign of war. It was a sign of, of revolt, and that's what the people wanted. Said, come on, Jesus, come on, son of David. You know, we, we want you to take over the Roman oppression. In here, in Revelation, it's a sign of, it's, we're talking about Jesus. It's Jesus here just as he was there. He is alive here as, as well. And, and think about the picture that, that God is giving the author of Revelation, that's the Apostle John, who wrote this down, to give all who are suffering this message of Jesus Christ. The people he's talking to originally were people who were getting killed for their faith. And they needed hope. They needed confidence. They needed peace. And here they are. They are seeing this huge crowd that's moving and dancing and singing and waving palm branches. They're crying out with a loud voice where it says in verse 10, the salvation of God. And I'm thinking, friends, we've got to learn to worship like this. <laughs> I think we're just beginning to. 
I mean, this, this is real worship that we read about here. This, this group of people, this heavenly crowd, these are people who came through the tribulation. They came through a time where there are wars and rumors of war, where people are getting killed for their faith, getting persecuted because they're Christians. Oh, guess what time that is? We're in. In this world, you will have tribulation, Jesus himself said. But take heart, I've overcome the world. We're in that time now. We're in that time now. It goes on to say in verse 13 of Revelation 7, one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? Where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who've come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is such an important message right here in this text. Because God tells us that when Jesus died on that cross, his blood that was shed for us is what cleansed us. When we look at the Old Testament, and it talks about the killing, the sacrificing of animals, we aren't, the, the, the people then, they did not receive forgiveness for their sins through that blood, but the blood that it foreshadowed. We learn about that in Romans. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. It's like God is outside of time. He takes his cross and he plants it right here, right in the center of time. And when Jesus died on the cross, his blood cleanses all who believed in him as the promise to come or the promise fulfilled. That's the message we're giving. And so all these people believing in Jesus, they're wearing white robes because they've been cleansed. Pastor Mann said something today I thought was so cool. He said, you know, sometimes we question ourselves. If you're like me, you always question yourself. Am I really good enough? Am I good enough to get to heaven? Am I good enough to be, a, to be the husband, to be the father, to be a pastor? Am I really good enough? No, we're not good enough for any of that stuff. But in Jesus Christ, guess what? We're perfect. He says you're righteous. We were at a small group. It was a few weeks ago, maybe months ago. I don't remember now, but it was a time ago. And, and we talked about that and said, do you feel very righteous? And I remember the guy sitting across from me. It was Rick. He was sitting across from me. He goes, no, I don't feel very righteous. I said, I don't either, but you are. He goes, well, no, because I'm still sitting. No, you are. You are righteous, meaning you're right with God because you are cleansed with the blood of Jesus Christ. I said, but I'm still a sinner. Yeah, that's because on this side of eternity, you are both sinner and saint. You are both imperfect and perfect. Because you have the Holy Spirit in you, but you also have your sinful nature. We got a dual nature going on. We got a battle going on. Anybody feel like you got a battle going on? Read Romans 7 one time and, and listen to what the Apostle Paul says about, oh, why am I doing the things that I don't want to do and I'm not doing the things I want to do? And he goes on and on. He's, he's confused. He's upset. Some people say that's pre-conversion. Paul, no, it's not. It's post-conversion. He became a believer in Jesus Christ, and he's still a sinner. Well, guess what? So am I. And so are you. That's why I like using that phrase, the ground is level at the foot of the cross, because there's no one here who needs Jesus more or less than anyone else. We all need him equally. We all do. This is a message of hope, and this is a message of saying, you know what, no matter what life dumps on you, no matter what kind of broken relationship you're hurting from, no matter what kind of job loss or financial stress you're under, no matter what kind of addictions are haunting you, God loves you. And by His grace and His glory and His power, you believe in Him, in the end, everything's going to be okay. And we're all going to be worshiping together. When we confess the Apostles' Creed together just a few moments ago that we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, that's what we're talking about here. It's the gathering together of, of, of the communing together of people of like faith. That's what we're talking about. Well, let's go back to that word saint, though. What is a saint? I know Pastor Mann was asking people, he had some people come up here, and then he says, put an S in front of their name, write their names down, then put an S in front of them, if you think they're a sinner, and put an S in front of those you think are a saint. And the bottom line was, there should have been two S's in front of each one of them. But sometimes we get mixed up, and we get judgmental, you know? But the reality is, people who believe in Jesus Christ are both sinner and saint. 
If you ask God, he says there's two kinds of saints. The first one is this, those who died knowing Jesus as their Savior. They're not sinner saints, they're called saints alone. My dad, who was a sinner, is a saint only now. A saint alone. You know somebody who's with the Lord now, their sins are gone. Their sinful nature is gone. That's why it's going to be a fun reunion. It's not going to be like the family reunions some of us dread. It's going to be a good one. The second kind of saint is those who are still alive, like you and me, knowing Jesus as their Savior. We are sinners and saints. You see, when we say we believe in the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, we are actually confessing the reality of the mystery this, this mystery that we are connected across time and space to all people who believe in Jesus. That's it. Because the community of saints isn't even just our assembly here right now, or those of you who are online joining us, or the, or the Christian churches in our circuit, or in our district, or in our nation, but Christians not only even across the world, but from all time. That's the community of saints that we celebrate today. All Saints Day. We remember those who are the saints alone. And God says, use them to encourage you. That's what I do. I look at a picture of my mom, come to my eye, but I find encouragement. I find encouragement because I know they would want the best for me. I know they would want me to change from some of my ways and be stronger in my faith. And that helps me. And that's, that's how God intends those kinds of saints, our loved ones who've gone before us to do for us. You see, what's interesting about the Halloween crowd and the heavenly crowd is that we both believe in the same mystery, the rising from the dead. That's why I like that line so much in that song, you know, that his hands will lift us from the grave. And I doubt there's anyone here, when I saw the hands before, I doubt there's anyone here who doesn't know somebody who's waiting for you right now who's in the heavenly realm. Now, they're not saying hurry up. <laughs> that time's going to come. <laughs> That's God's call. Let it come. It will. But know that his promises are real. Know that a heavenly home is real. That a place where there is no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears. That's real. But while you're here, God wants you and me to become stronger in our faith so that we can pass that on, pass on that teaching. That's why we say here our mission is to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And the best legacy of faith we can leave is just that, a legacy of faith. Telling our loved ones that they have a God who loves them. And they're connected to believers across time and space. You know, one of the questions, the most common questions I get, is um, people saying, am I good enough? Say, am I really included in that number? Am I really a part of that? Remember the song? Remember the song? As the saints, when the saints, we're saying it. In, and when the saints go marching in, oh Lord, I want to be in that number. When the saints go marching in. Let's sing it again. Come on. Get up here. When the saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, Lord, I want to be in that number. When the saints go marching in. All right. Amen, amen. This is not a wish, all right? This is not something that is a hope, as I said, only because... You, you, you think it's not true. No, it's a hope only now because it hasn't happened yet, but it's going to. Know Jesus as your Savior and know that you're one of 144,000. And he's got a room, he's got a mansion, and he's got people waiting for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please pray.